Hey, what's going on, guys? We are doing yet another podcast. This is the first one uh, I've done in a very long time, and we've changed up a whole ton of things. As you can see right back yonder, somewhere over there, this is not a car wash. We'll talk about that. We've changed the title. We've changed a bunch of things around, including the room. You can see I got my Rage Against the Machine back there, and I got some products here. It's kind of neat. So I'm having a good time. Um, and of course, for my first guest, you guys know I have to have Kevin Brown. He's in the green room right now. Um, I wanted to uh, bring him on because I've never really asked him any questions about, uh, certainly in podcasts or in videos, we're usually doing some sort of, you know, polishing technique or whatever about his personal life. Like how did he get started and, and, and the lessons that, that came with that. So I'm kind of excited to dive deep into that. We'll have other episodes to talk about the washer and pad pressure and, and what have you. But today we're going to be talking about that. Plus the topic of is detailing an art or is it a craft? And I know that that is a hot button thing. So we're going to poke that balloon and see what happens when we, uh, when, we, when we talk to Kevin about that. But beforehand, I want to kind of get you guys used to uh, this new format. So we're doing a little bit of housekeeping. But right at this point in the podcast, uh, I've learned this from Farah, by the way, we're going to do an ad. I don't have anything to sell at the moment, except <laughs> the, there's, no, there's no ads here other than Ammo ATA. Uh, the ATA 300, I worked very, very hard, 90 episodes, both Kevin, Jason. Um, I have CPAs. I have lawyers i have all i have experts in um uh and, and facebook ads and google and basically what it is about how to make actual profit in the detailing business everybody wants to talk about you know how much uh compound to use and what's your favorite pad and what's your favorite but it, that's all great but it sort of isn't important if you're not making money on it. there's only so long you can do this um this passion that we have this wonderful uh um, career but if you're not making any money uh that's that's what this whole course is about so we have 90 episodes check it out i'll talk more about it i have a ton of videos but uh, make sure you reach out to me so without further ado let's pull in the man the myth the legend kevin brown how are you sir i'm good thank you no no i'm yeah. talking i'm talking to you i'm talking to you your um, studio looks good yeah it's yeah. fun isn't it cool i just painted the ceiling I was in here like whipping around and I get like super like focused on like, I have to paint the ceiling that I didn't cover everything, <laughs> uh, the table. And so there's like these little dots everywhere I'm staring at right now from like the, the roller, you know, the, the little mist that comes down from the roller. So there's no blobs anywhere, oh, but no. I can feel it oh. on the table and I want to like sand the whole thing off, but whatever. What looks... you told me when you did your first, uh, ice blasting, uh, oh god! <laughs> oh god! I'm still cleaning my ears out from that whole thing. I, that's probably the most you know, common question I get right now. They're like, "Dude, that thing looked amazing." I'm like, "Yes, in theory, that was amazing, but the downsides were just like astronomical." But yes, I'm still cleaning everything from that. Yeah, it just went everywhere. Huh? Yeah, it 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 did its job at what it was going to do, but the the it's sort of like um. I always use the analogy, like, I want to kill this fly. And it's like, instead of like killing it with a fly swatter, you like nuke the entire street. And it's like, well, yeah, you killed, you killed the fly, but you also yeah. knocked down like five houses. <laughs> like, well, how, how do you, uh, what's your overall opinion on that? Um, because I haven't done dry ice, but it's very interesting and it's been around a long time, but it's getting shrunken down to where we could utilize it. But the, the videos I've seen and the shots I've seen, it's it's just very impressive, but it's maybe not always feasible. Maybe it takes longer sometimes. Maybe it's too expensive. Right? Yeah. So from like the business perspective, that's a good question. I, the, it was originally designed from what I understood for the Navy. So like when they would go and clean Navy ships that were out to sea, or um, I should say not out to sea, in the water uh, next to the dock, what they would do is they'd put it on the dry dock. Um, not, I guess dry dock is an actual boating term. When the dock that's next to the boat, they would put all the machinery there. They would run the hose and a dude would get in like a little dinghy or whatever and power blast, mm -hmm. in this case, ice blast the side of the ship. Why? Because you couldn't do it with anything else because it would contaminate the water because the boat, the ship, the battleship, whatever was in the water. And I was like, oh, that totally makes sense because the same concept here, when you're, when you're cleaning the underneath of the car, there's no residue left other than the dirt that you cleaned off. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's where it made the most sense. Then it moved over into like factories. So when people were making, I don't know what I'm talking about, but like huge caramel things like uh, to make uh, uh, candy bars or whatever, as they go through those huge, massive pipes, like a little bit would like leak out. And now you'd have these massive gobs of oily, thick stuff and they couldn't do anything with it. You can't clean it because it kind of like sticks to itself and makes a nightmare. So they sell a lot of these machines. The guy goes in, blast that big thing of caramel or whatever, and then just 
breaks it off and it goes. And it's like, oh, okay, that's logical. So the progression came all the way down. And then somebody said, hey, what about the grease on engines? When you take that, when you hit that with the grease on the engine, that comes right off. It's unbelievable. But the downside is, as I said in a couple of videos to your question, is it's incredibly loud. It's wildly expensive. The amount of air that's required is like a small Volkswagen. You have to have a turbo, you know, like a diesel. You know yeah. better than I would, a huge diesel. Um, and so to kick that and to get that power for that much, meaning cleaning uh, like a bell housing or something like of, that. A lot of energy. To, Correct. To do that task. Yeah. So what they've done now is I said, Hey, what if we lower it down? What if we make a single use, um, not single use, uh, like a smaller gun that's just for, let's say like calipers and like little tight spots. And strategic, so the market yeah. strategic, that's the word I'm looking for. So the market's actually, um, done that. And so uh, I'll leave their names out cause I'm not exactly doing it, but I went to SEMA just like when you saw Rupes and you're like, Oh my God, this is what, this is what we've been looking for, et cetera. I saw yeah. this and I was like, Oh wow, this is dope. This is this is I mean it was it was this big. It was like chest big. You could pick it up, no problem, not a big deal. You put it on top of a cart. So I walked over and I was like, Can I use this? Of course, and blah, 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 blah. And I was like, this thing's freaking amazing. So sure enough, that company called and said, Hey, we'd like to make, you know, uh i I want you to change it and play with it and then make it better. We're still getting into the market or whatever. Very, 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 very nice people. And they sent me one of them and actually flew in and, and did walked around and showed me the whole thing. And I was like, this is amazing. This is great. And I actually put it, in, I think, in one episode. I was, uh, I think the Acura NSX maybe. I can't remember. But I, I use it in a video. Long and short of it is, I think it's amazing. The downside that most people don't get. Here's the interesting part. So we took away the compressor. So now you're just plugging it into your regular, um, when I say compressor, I mean the, the Volkswagen that was parked outside that cost me a fortune yeah, to rent. Yeah. Now you just plug it into your regular regular compressor size, like a decent size and nothing crazy. And then you plug it in electric, boop, plug in, you're good to go. The downside is you have to have ice there that's really good ice on a regular basis. And to do that, you have to be like ninja scheduled out. So my point from a business perspective is if you don't do it on a professional basis, you are the ice blasting guru. You're not going to be able to have the cars pile through at this flow that makes it prudent to buy that much ice. Otherwise, the ice dies. So the instant it arrives, it's half lifing all the time. So by the, the next morning or the next you know day or two or whatever, depending on the humidity outside, you just spent like three hundred dollars on ice that's gone. Yeah. So. To me, I was like, I, I can't see that as being like, a, you can't just like pick it out and be like, oh, I, I found a spot yeah. that I need it. You get what I'm saying? That's not your business model. You're you're dealing with a much different type of a vehicle or A to Z, brand new, dial it in, PPF. Oh, yeah. PPF, Tamp, brand new car, coding. I mean, that's where yeah. the real money is. But I see the need. I see why people would want that because they yeah. – um, you know, our society, we can get into deep stuff or our society wants like, you put a coating on a car, I never have to wash it again. Mentality. That's not right, but that's what I think. I can, anything that's underneath the car, I can go, and now it's perfectly clean. I'm like, no, no. So that I can see the demand is what I'm, I was looking for. The demand from the public because of the, the definition of the word ignorance. They're ignorant, meaning I'm ignorant on brain surgery. I, I don't know, but they're ignorant in not having the experience. They just go, that's going to solve the problem, and it doesn't. And so detailers are jumping because the demand is there. But per my ATA that I was just telling you about, if you do the math and you take this course or what have you, you'll see quickly there's no money in it unless it's your full-time business and you devote and then you have literally have cars lined up on the outside. Then you can kind of – yeah. you get what I'm saying? Well, I can see where it's uh, intriguing – interesting from a customer perspective or somebody has a classic oh, yeah. car that doesn't want it damaged and doesn't want you know things rotted out I mean, that's the cleanest way to do it it's like wow this guy's going to use dry ice and knock away the debris and get it down to the natural cast aluminum and not gonna scuff it up yeah or, 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 the after know. picture is great and bring yeah. a trailer probably caused most of this stuff i mean bring a trailer you know the you know like the next ebay kind of thing for cars yeah Bring a trailer, I mean, probably is selling more of these ice blasters than the ice blasters themselves because people are like, oh, this thing has been ice blasted. It looks easy too. It's like well, this is a this is a one one step deal. It does everything. So yeah, and if you anyway, use the big I, one, you have to have 
to you to have it actually take out like like two finger size brrr, you have to have the volkswagen outside kicking that the much monster. so the little one is like a little so, i mean you'll be there till your eyeballs fall out just to try to do one caliper yeah. it's it's not it's not there yet it's not there right yet, in my opinion yeah Anyhow, I don't know where the hell we went with that, but there, there you uh, go. Thank the you. The room looks great. <laughs> <laughs> See what happens when you poke me? That you, I, you pulled a fast one right now. I mean, I was supposed to be asking you questions. Um, but yeah, thanks. The room looks good. Um, how are you doing out there? Because we just got a foot of snow literally today. Are you nice and warm? No complaints. Went... It's the weather out here is always great. So um, yeah, you don't really on you, but I haven't seen snow until it went out of my area. So yeah. So we're I. I as you know, I hate snow. I want to be in the bubble, in the warm and all that kind of stuff. It's a pain in the butt. But I did get my Cayenne back. With the video's going up soon. Um, I was like the first time I was. It's like a, like a television commercial with like the Chevy comes through the snow and like the snow blasts up like yeah. this, and the guy's like, "Yeah," and he's like freaking out and do it. That was legit me this morning. I don't know if you saw my Instagram post, this but going to be your new favorite car you've had. Oh uh, yeah, I, it's between that and the Model T, and so. Mm. I, I, you know, I'm getting to the part now, uh, or the point where I'm not, it's not all about supercars and how shiny they are. It's really about the smiles per hour or the smiles per mile kind of thing. And the model T, I mean, there's just nothing like it. You're going 20 miles an hour and you're like, yeah, like and the entire waving at you. Oh, yeah. How to drag with one hand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and back. I'm going, <laughs> ah, ooh, yeah. ah, ooh, yeah. so everyone, it's, 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 so mm -hmm. this one has that kind of, Je ne sais quoi. It's not very expensive. I mean, it's a, it's a Cayenne. It's 10 years old. You know, we did all this work to it. It's beautiful. It's amazing. Uh, interior is great. Was, there was low miles. It's diesel. It's just kind of a weird, funky thing. But that thing is a brick house. Like, I went out. There's nobody on the road. There's a foot of snow. Snow uh, School's canceled. I'm the only psycho driving around. And it was like I found a parking lot and just went. <laughs> so... Uh, the video is coming out soon. I, I had an absolute blast on that. So, um, yeah, you don't get to experience that because you get sun and surfing. We have sand <laughs> with the sun. So I'll bring some salt next time for beaches. you. <laughs> um, so today's sort of topic, of course, is the art and craftsman. I know I, I like pushing your buttons on that one to really kind of explore that. But before we get too deep into that, um, I wanted to start off. We're going to have a lot of podcasts. We're going to talk about a lot about yeah. specific things and questions that pop up. And by the way, um, one of the things we're going to be, uh, I'll put some links in the description below. If, if you have questions at the end, this is my first podcast and we, 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 you know, are going to be shooting a couple of them, but in the future, we're going to have a section of, you know, 10 minutes worth of Kevin, people want to ask you questions. Here are the questions. This is the first one. So nobody knows about it. I'll put a link in the description. If you have a question for Kevin or myself, send it to us um, and then I'll read it at the end and we can have a discussion about it. So we're not going to do that today for obvious reasons. So with that being said, uh, to start off, it sounds a little bit crazy, but I've known you for a very, very long time and we talk a lot, but I haven't really understood or at least asked the question, um, regrettably, about your past, where you grew up, how you got, not just like, where did you grow up and how did you get into detailing? I'm asking like, where did you grow up, uh, you know, not so much how your childhood was, but how was your childhood? Where did you, did you guys travel? Was your dad in the army? I, I have no idea about these things. And then that transition from, yeah, I just go to high school, whatever, to, oh my God, that car looks amazing. I want to clean it. Like what what happened there? What were some of the lessons? So, oh my gosh, that's a big topic. Yeah, so Something ready, life. go. <laughs> 30 minutes or less. <laughs> yeah, no, where'd you, uh, we'll start off with, where did you grow up, my man? Southern California. SoCal. Born and uh, lived down there maybe 25 years in total. But What's the town? Was, uh, Santa Ana, California. And where is that? Like, I don't know anything about California, really. What? Give me another town. Uh, 10 minutes from where you where you and I first met at McGuire's headquarters. Oh, so Irvine. Yep, right on the border of Irvine. And oh, and like Santa Huntington Ana. Beach. Is that why you're friends with – is that why you know Derek and Jason? Because aren't no, they there? Uh, no, I never met Jason because he was a McGuire's rep in my area, which I currently live. And where, where I met Jason, I live about 200 miles north of Santa Ana. So I'm still considered close to Southern California. California is huge. Yeah. I mean, it's a very long state. So if you can get somewhere in, a, in two or three hours, you're still kind of local, you know? Really? So uh, I'm local to Southern California within a few hours. And Jason Rose... Uh, was the McGuire's rep in my area when I was detailing full-time and I used to see his van drive by and I'd always miss him 
And then one time I saw him under a tent at an open house at a auto body paint supply. So I stopped and met him there. And that's, that's where things kicked off with Jason and me. But Derek Bemis, I met for the first time at SEMA when they uh, tapped his shoulder to uh, be in charge of the Ford SEMA team, which was a collaboration with uh, McGuire's. Someone at McGuire's and someone at Ford were very good friends. Like and Pennington put, or something like that? Yeah. And so we, we put together, they put together a team of top tier guys to take care of all the Ford vehicles at SEMA. And Derek was in charge of that. So it was just like decades where, before I shot that video with you guys doing yeah. that. This was way yeah. before then. Several years before. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So I, I'd never seen him before. I never like, who is this guy? Yeah, he was thinking, "Who is this guy?" Yeah, you both <laughs> are looking at each other. Both looking at each other. Look at this guy with no hair, and you're like, "Look at this yeah, guy with this crazy exactly. hair." <laughs> yeah. Uh, but initially, he was. In the long run, he was definitely the right guy to, to to head that up. But we first didn't see eye to eye because I was so particular and persnickety. He's like, "We got seventy cars, man. You need to move." Right. So I just started saying, you just keep going and I'll just tag behind and clean up what I see to be uh, subpar, you know, door jams and corners and things. And he was getting pretty upset with me. Uh, but in the long run, it worked out that uh, one of the cars that had come in was so bad. It came in probably around midnight. We, you know, we'd work night and day on these cars to get them ready and get very little sleep. And it was the first year we had done this. So we really wanted to impress everyone. And in this case, at the time, uh, Jaguar and Ford were together. So we had a car come in at midnight or 1230, the only Jaguar. And it was obviously just finished up. And it was head to toe covered in polishing dust and debris and just grime. And so we had to hustle through that one to get it done. But it was so rough you know it was just i, I kept spending time it's like we gotta go we gotta go come on man you're dragging and i was like man this is the only jaguar in here it's the highest end brand that they have it's the only one in here and i'll just do it on my lunch break you know so i did and lo and behold it's a good thing i did and so he saw that when when the you know the the higher ups came up and looked, came right to that Jaguar. Like, man, this looks great. It kind of showed like he was right because we have a schedule to keep. We can only spend X amount of time on each car, but you also got to figure out, well, which cars are the ones that we really got to look out for. Which yeah. It's really going to bite us if we're not careful. And the Jaguar, uh, it, it was looked at very closely. And so anyway, we learned that each other had very, uh, very specific tasks and we had our strengths. And so ever since then, just had total respect for Derek and uh, appreciated the fact that we grew up close by each other. Right. I was never a guy that went surfing, you know, he was, he's oh, that yeah. guy, mm -hmm. right? So I was just a regular guy would ride a skateboard, but he would ride a surfboard. I'd ride my bike down to the beach to watch a guy like him be in the beach, right? But we're both local to Southern California. And we're both what I termed to him one day is like, man, we're just street detailers. You know, we we did our work in the street. I had a truck and I'd pull up to the street and I'd start washing cars when you could do that. And it wasn't a big deal. And I was like, what are you doing? You know, what 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 is this guy doing out in the street with this truck? What's he spraying back when mobile detailing was brand new? And that's the other thing is Southern California is the mecca of car culture. Uh, and car detailing, you know, it's it's where it really got its legs. It was where it became a big thing. And, um, you know, fast, you know, go back a little bit, but fast forward from where I grew up, uh, I needed a job back when I was out of high school. And um, I was working for my dad and I was thinking, I want to do something else. So I just looked in the want ads one day and I looking through back when you had newspapers that were really thick and big and people put the ads so you could find your job through the newspaper, yeah. you know, not like today. And it said right there, car detail. I'm like, that's what I want to do. That's what I want. to. How do. old so are I you went, at this point? Uh, 18. 18. 18. And is that, is that the first job that you had and, and that was it forever? Or did you like, you know, uh, I don't know, go into, were you a CPA for 10 minutes or I, I don't know. Was you something? No, I mean, in, through high school and junior high school, I would do, you know, we had paper out and, 
would mow lawns and uh, in the summer I would work for the, they had these state programs for the state that you could work at the schools and I would paint bathrooms and curbs and things. So I started painting stuff when I was 17, 16 years old. Uh, and then, uh, so I can get money to buy my bike, you know, my, mm -hmm. my beach cruiser mm -hmm. and things like that. But uh, when I got that job, uh, it, I was lucky, you know, I happened to find in the one ad, what was turned out to be at the time, the, the most high end detail shop in the country, the most prestigious one there ever was. I mean, it, it was the beginning of high end detailing, or at least how it was marketed. Right. It was, it was in one of those towns close by where I was talking about and, uh, Costa Mesa, Newport Beach, all those areas down there. But I I just started washing cars there, you know, and, and we'd have to take the keys in to the office and go out and do another car. And the first time I went in, I couldn't believe what I saw on the wall there. I, I didn't realize that the place I had gone to was world renowned. You know, there was posters uh, of articles from this place from uh, ABC you know, NBC, CBS, Plan, uh, Penthouse, Playboy, Car and Driver, Road and Track, all write-ups. For the this, cars or for the detailing? For the detailing shop, this guy. What was this Steve, guy's name? Steve Marchese. What was the name of the shop? Steve's Detailing. And uh, he was just, I didn't have any idea that where I walked into was so world-renowned. I mean, hmm. he had... He, he intrigued so many different uh, media outlets that he had write-ups on all this stuff. So basically what I'm saying is I lucked out. You know, I went to a place uh, that was perceived to be high-end and marketed as high-end, and it did high-end work for the time. And then I started cleaning interiors there. He had two shops. He had one that I was there, uh, that I started at, and then one that was in a prestigious um, shopping center. And so um, I started doing interiors there. They trained me how to do interiors. And, and we're doing all the hot cars of the day, right? You know, everything that was super cool, Rolls Royces and Ferraris and Porsches and Audis, all those cars. So those are the cars I learned on. Mm. And I learned in a very basic format, meaning the cleaners we had and um, the polishing they did, it was very basic compared to the day standards. So meaning had, like hand, like what what's yeah. basic, the, the chemicals? toothbrushes and cotton towels and the chemicals were very limited. Um, one kind of uh, water-based degreaser for everything except the leather. Oh, yeah. And then one for the, the all-purpose cleaner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was actually, you know, we do smart and final leather, you know, uh, uh, degreaser. It was like $3 a gallon back then. And yeah. you just dilute it way down and it was safe on all the uh, surfaces of the vehicle with the exception of the, the, the leathers and uh, the wool. Um, cause at the time those seat covers were really popular. So we had a second, uh, non-butyl pH balanced water-based cleaner for those things. But that's where I learned you don't need 10 different compounds and you don't need 17 different cleaners and liquids. I, I remember one time I used to pride myself on having 14 different liquid you know, products that do, I could do every car, you know, I have a lacquer thinner, I have a water-based degreaser, I have a tire dressing, I have a leather conditioner, I have a metal polish and these certain things. So you could do most, most detailing tasks with a very limited arsenal of products, hmm. you know? And so uh, anyway, I just lucked out that this place was very high end and uh, I didn't stay there a long time, but what I, year, I what year is this? Like approximately uh, 80, 84, 1984, 1984. Now at this point in 1984, there was detailing. I'm sure not like it is today with, you know, everybody and their brother is a detailer and it's all on Instagram and, and what have you. But is there other shops other than Steve's around or is it just kind of like, yeah. that's that one guy and there's like 50 miles until there's another guy or there's like five there, guys. There wasn't, there wasn't the abundance like there are today. Uh, I remember one time when I was going to start mobile detailing, which a pretty new idea. You didn't see a lot of that. Matter of fact, it was really intriguing. The first time I saw uh, a pamphlet for that, man, that is insane. You know, that, that's crazy that you can do that. Somebody took the time to set up a system in a truck. And so I, you know, we copied the truck, you know, uh, a, a couple pick, of guys. A pickup truck me, or like a, like a van? Together. Huh? A pickup truck or like a van? Yeah, my, yeah, a pickup truck, a, a mini truck, you know, a, a Toyota pickup. And I um, I set my Toyota pickup that way because 
I could park it in the garage. Um, we have great weather. And so you, mostly what you see now is trailers or minivans or vans, but I did everything out of my pickup truck and it was perfect. And I didn't even have a snug lid on it. I didn't have a lid or anything on it. It was just open. You know, I, I had deionized water tanks on it, hose reels, pressure washer, vacuum, everything I needed in there to do A to Z. You know, everything that we done on the McLaren car, I could do with that truck. Hmm. I had enough storage in that little Toyota pickup uh, to hold everything I needed to, to do a 30 hour detail to, to, to do 13 cars, washes a day, whatever I needed to do. So that's after Steve. So you got out of high school, you went to Steve's, this famous yeah. guy. By the way, is he alive? Is this the place still going? I'm not sure. Uh, Steve's was uh, very um, successful in that he started franchising Steve's detailings. And I think at one time they had well over 100. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe 160 even. It was a, lo it was a, lot, of, a lot of outlets in a short period of time, but I'm not sure what happened with that whole thing. You're, you're talking about the era of franchising, you know, back in, in the, in the eighties, the big thing was carpet cleaning, right? It was like, Oh man, you could be an entrepreneur and you could carpet clean. Really? And so the, the, the word of the day, Stanley was steamer. Oh, yeah. What's that? Stanley steamer kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. There was, there, it was the biggest thing in Southern California was, at the time was to do carpets. Um, there was a lot of, you could look it up, but that time in Southern California, entrepreneurship, you know, starting a business. Mm. Um, if you started a business, you became an entrepreneur. You, be, you know, it's like, that's why the, that word to me, it connotates um, like trying to make it sound bigger than you really are. Yeah, like, hey, okay, yeah. I got a bucket and a sponge and brushes. I got some flyers. Man, I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> They're like, no, you just started a little business. Right, right. I'm a businessman now. Yeah. So uh, some kind of terms like that kind of rub me a little bit like, yeah, it gives me the cringe. Like, I, mm. you know, there are true entrepreneurs that lay it all on the line and invest heavily and, mm. and they're you know, trendsetters, but not everybody is. yeah it's a little bit of a catch-all phrase i get it yeah yeah but in the middle of those the, one of the biggest things that happened to me between working at steve's and doing mobile detailing was i needed to buy a wheel for my little dots and pickup at the time i had a little dots and pickup and i got in a car accident with it and it smashed my wheel up so i had to find this this wheel this keystone wheel and nobody had it but this one store so i called up and said, do you have this wheel? He goes, yeah, we've got that wheel. Come on down. I'll get you taken care of. So I went down there, opened the doors of this hot rod shop, right? You know, and my, 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 my mind was blown. I mean, I, as soon as I opened the doors, I was blasted with rock and roll music. There must have been 30 people in this store. There was seven or eight guys behind the counter. And the second I came in, this guy's like, hey, man, why don't you come up here and grab a number? We'll get right with you. What are you looking for? So, uh, look. I'm looking for a wheel. A new those. pair of pants right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it was like the commercials of the, the drag racing race cars this weekend. That, yeah. Know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of energy yeah. in a building. And I must have waited for 30 or 40 minutes happily because every every few minutes somebody say, hey, man, we'll be right with you. We haven't forgot about you. You got a number, right? Okay. So it was just energy, energy, energy. And so when I finally got my help, uh, the guy went, let's go look at your truck. Man, that's a great truck. Oh, man. Hey, uh, I've got that wheel in stock, but have you ever thought about putting uh, knockoffs on that? Let me show you. So he brought me into the store, showed me a set of knockoffs. I'm like, I like those. He goes, yeah, and they're like $29.95. And then he said, like, you ought to put some locks on those wheels, right? And we got this 20, 24 pack, you know, and they're $29.95. I'm like, okay. He's like, hey, you ever heard of low profile tires? I'm like, no, what are those? He, so he showed me a tire. He actually took the tire, rolled it out to my truck, kneeled down, set it next to the truck. How cool would that look? I'm like, yeah, but I, I don't really need tires and I can't afford those. It's no problem. We got layaway. Like layaway? Yeah, you can put down any amount of money you want, whatever you're comfortable with, and you come in to make payments. I said, yeah, but what happens if I don't make a payment? It's no problem. They're not scheduled, right? He keeps going. Every time I had a negative, he had a positive. So he hooked me on a layaway for a hundred dollars. He got, I got, I went out of there with a wheel, lug nuts, knockoffs, a layaway and a job application. Wow. Yeah. I had to work there. I just like, I have to work here. So I got the, I got the interview. I had to take a test. 
you know, I didn't do so well on the test, but I really wanted to learn about what, cars. What, what kind what, of test did you have to take? Like a, a well, written test? Well, it was an automotive hot rod store. They sold camshafts and manifolds. So, and like, give me a rates. question from the test. It could be the most basic thing, like... Um, I mean, this is a long what time. Does, ago, what does a camshaft do kind of thing? Or like what's, kind of thing, what's yeah. like, you know. Yeah, a car's missing. What could it be? So anyway, I, I did so bad on that test because I didn't know anything. I mean, I loved cars. You know, the parking that's lot's fun. real dirty and we got a broom here. That's that's about the. Well, guess what? Is that right? Everybody, it turns out. So here's what happened. I got hired. And the reason I got hired, this guy, Alan, Alan Basham, he's one of my all-time favorite guys to work with and work for. He said, the reason I went to bat for you is, he says, Quite frankly, you don't know anything about cars, but your <laughs> attitude is great, so you're hired. Right. So, you know, your job is what everybody's job was, including mine. It's just you're going to sweep the parking lot, you're going to go and get the lunches, you're going to check in the orders, and you're going to mount and balance tires and install shocks. That's what you do. That's what everybody at that at, at Super Shops, that was, that was the company, did. Everybody started at the bottom and work their way up so you learned to get the lunch order right and to, to sweep the curbs or you know and and to install things properly and to put the order away in, in, a, in a neat clean and organized manner you learned all these things that would help you down the road to run a store mm. to be neat to be clean to be organized to know how to sweep properly put things away properly tag things right and so uh i was so um, timid uh, to even go to the front of the store because that was just a world that was like very aggressive and you know i mean it's hot yeah. rods it's cars it's drag yeah. racing it's you know so anyway what they did was once you got going and you knew you we were going to stay a while they'd say hey you you stick next to jerry and listen to what jerry says okay you just listen to him talk to these customers and just it's interesting but just by re hearing the the repeated terminology and and how to sell and how to ask questions you pick up on that right you don't realize you are but you do mm -hmm. and then eventually they say you go ahead and help this customer and jerry's going to tag along with you and if you get stuck you just ask jerry and that's how you learn to sell and it, it worked uh, tremendously well tremendously efficient way to teach someone a task or a craft or you know to get knowledge and so eventually you're on your own and you're feeling pretty good and they say you, you get stuck you come get somebody and we'll help you and so i would do that and then uh, if you were good at this stuff they'd say hey sometimes somebody doesn't show up for work or somebody's sick or they got they, they need extra help and, and then we'll send someone we call them a floater well you're going to be the floating salesman so you're going to go to la mirada and you're going to go to uh, you know garden grove and costa mesa all these local stores mm. They'll call and say, I need a floater. I need to I need to clean things up. I need to get wheels and tires out front. Anyway, it was a fantastic uh, beginning of of learning how to be neat, clean, and organized, to learn about cars, to learn about customer service. Um, and then you got promoted to assistant manager at the slowest store in the country. You know, like, hey, you're not quite ready to be a manager, but we're going to push you there. So we're going to put you in the slowest store in the country and see how you do. How many stores and did I they do. have? Uh, at the time, when I was first hired, they had about 50 or so, 50 wow. to 60 stores nationwide. And they were, and they were opening at the rate of about uh, three stores a month. Holy so geez. at that time, they were growing tremendously. And there was another um, lesson to be learned there, too, because eventually you cannot continue to grow without good people and educated people, trained people. So you dilute your quality of uh, employee, right. you know, and at some point it, it, it's a hinder. It's, it, it's smarter to say, Hey, until we get our whole st staff and team strong again and qualified and let's get some time under the belt, we should wait. But inevitably you continue to grow. It's like a snowball. And I think that was one of the downfalls of that company was over expansion, you know, too quickly and then jumping into other categories of selling like online, you know, or mail order. So uh, but regardless, collapse? I learned so much about business and sales mm. and marketing and customer service at super shops. It was the best job I ever had. How long were you there? So, uh, not that long, just from um, about two and a half 
two and three quarter years. But in that period of time, I would work, you know, hundreds of hours. I mean, I would work six days a week. I became, you know, where you'd open the store, close the store, do the displays, hire, you know, or interview people, things like that. And and had to do it as a manager. You have to do a, a sales training or a meeting every day, every morning, your whole team. You have to talk about customer service, um, product information, the store, how to sell, how to answer the phone, the things that happen with certain customers, things like that. So every day you had to get in front of your team of guys and inspire them to be better and give them the knowledge they needed to be better. And do, we'd do skits. We'd pretend I was a customer and Dirk was the, the guy, you know, selling me stuff. And we, you know, it was a, it was a good way to put you on the spot or, or teach you to, you know, don't say that, say this, or at that point, come get, come get, you know, Dave and he'll help you, right? How to, how to double team, how to hand over a customer. Um, and you know, what's funny is most of the guys that worked there really loved it. Um, and I think minimum wage at the time was when I started there it was $3 and 35 cents an hour. Yeah. And and they'd give you a raise and you're like, hey, we're going to give you a raise and it's not a lot of money, but we want you to know that you're doing great. And um, so we're raising you a, a, a dime, <laughs> 10 cents, <laughs> you know, 10 cents. But like they said, if if you are relying on the minimum wage and the 10 cents, uh, if that's what you're here for, you won't be here very long mm -hmm. because um, that's not what it's about. It's about moving up. So what they did do, though, they had these incentive programs they had several different contests so if larry if you came in and you were a salesman and we got you over the hump and you're there you're comfortable selling and you're mentioning layaway programs and you're you know you really like selling tires and wheels okay focus on tires and wheels right you could set a guy up with tires and wheels and uh, set him up on the layaway like hey kevin you should put the you know put these on layaway they're on sale and uh, what would I got to put down, Larry? Well, whatever you feel comfortable. Well, how often do I have to make payments, Larry? Whenever you want to. Well, how do I know, you know, are you going to hold the tires for me? We don't hold the product until you tell us you're ready. And that's how they did it, see? Other stores, you put something on layaway, they set it in the rack on the back and held it for you. Not super shops. They just say, you let me know when you're ready to get this and we'll have the product for you. That way you weren't tying up tons of inventory, mm. right? So you could afford to say, if you decide to change your mind, we'll give you your money back. Or if you can only put $5 this week, that's fine. If you want to put 100 that's fine. But the big thing was for you, Larry, the, the salesman, even if you were on your day off, when that guy came in to pick up his layaway order, say, I want to buy the, I want, I'm here to pick up my tires that I had on layaway, you got the, you got the credit. Well, what did that do for you? Well, BF Goodrich, which is one of the biggest brands that we sold at the time, they put up the money. Like, hey, we're going to put up the money, a contest. So, Larry, if you sell the most tires company-wide this month, first place is 1000 bucks. Oh, yeah. Second place is 750 Third place is 600 All the way down to 50th place, like $18. So if you just pushed tires – and layaways eventually you'll start making money on that contest so the 335 an hour doesn't really mean much if you can get a thousand here and the cam chefs bring you in three hundred dollars and the mallard ignitions bring you in 500 and you get 200 on apparel and you, you sell gabriel shops and you get 50 bucks so they had all these contests for each individual category but they also have one for total sales so like hey you sell anything at all even if it's not on a contest first place is a thousand bucks if you're the best one right and they also had this other incentive we called it the hall of fame like kevin when that guy comes in for a manifold and carburetor what else does he need to install it or what else is he removing to put that on well he's got to take the in intake manifold bolts off right well on the chevy they're they're just cast steel. they're just steel and they're orange and they're cruddy and they're rusty why would he want to put a brand new aluminum edel rock manifold on that and not put new bolts? And he's going to need a gasket scraper and he's going to need new gaskets. He's going to need silicone. He's going to have the ignition out, right? We got those on sale for $49.95. Oh, we got spark plugs for $24.95. Oh, you want to hold those away from the headers or the intake manifolds. Why would you put intake manifold on? when We got headers for $49.95. You need those bolts. So you would say, what does this guy need to put this on today? 
and you'd set the customer up with the things that he needs. Right. Because if he brought it back, you you don't need that, right? You're not trying to sell a guy something he doesn't need. But at the same time, if he didn't ever do it before, he doesn't know. Oh, I got to pull the carburetor off. Why do I want to put this thing back on? I could put a new Holly on for a hundred bucks. So eventually you get 15, 18, 20 items. And the guy came in like, man, my wife's going to kill me. I came in for the for the intake manifold for 99 bucks. <laughs> and I'm leaving like this, you know, $600 is going to kill me. Like, hey, anything you don't need, I'll take it back right now. But you said you got to work on Monday, right? And I don't want you pissed off at me because you don't have the bolts to put that on. No, I need it. I need it. You know, so we they came up with this thing and said, hey, if you get 20 items on a sale, you're in the Hall of Fame. We're going to put your name on the paper in every store in the United States to show what a badass salesman you are. So you had the Hall of Fame 20 liner club, and then you could go up to five times. So Kevin was on the... 20 liner club now he's there again and again and again like well guess what after five you got to go to the 30 liner club that and is five great. and the 40 liner club and you're like come on these guys there's no way there's no way boom 40 liner club boom 50 so they, they kept you motivated working that that's uh they kept us motivated and it taught you to qualify your customer to see what he needs, to learn how to say, hey, while you're doing that, you know, not trying to sell you, but it taught you how to bring things up and not to be afraid to mention, you might need this or you might benefit from these things. And so I, in my store, um, once I started at the Thousand Oaks store for six months, which was the slowest store in the country because it was Mercedes Benz, BMW, there wasn't a lot of hot rods up there, right? Mm -hmm. um, they said, you know, you done pretty well. We want to move you to um, either the Sacramento store, which is a very busy store, or Torrance. And they said, Torrance has never done what we thought it would. It happens to be on one of the top 10 busiest streets in the United States. It's between three big malls. It's just never done well. I'm like, well, Torrance is good for me. I know where Torrance is. I could live with my dad at his house. And um, I like that. So I went to Torrance. So in Torrance... I started out with, I walked in there and they had five salesmen. None of them like you because it's like, who's this guy? Mm. Who's this guy? We'll get rid of him in a week. You know, I'm a threat. I'm this new guy coming in. I'm a manager. I'm younger than they are. Or like, you know, I, I wasn't an intimidating guy. I was a quiet person. Mm. So I had five guys. We had a sales figure and they used to tell me, hey, you need to do 10% over the year before. That's your goal. If you're not doing 10% over the year before, you're not doing so well. You probably won't be a manager a long time, right? So that was your goal was 10% over the previous year's month. So if it's June, it's coming up, you know, you got to beat last June. So you have, you have a goal to reach and you have a crew. And so I would go into these stores as, as, a, as a floating salesman or as a floating assistant manager, or as a floating, you know, whatever. And I would redo all the displays and I would reorganize the back and I would clean the bathrooms. And I'd do everything that everyone else is supposed to do, but I'd do it to as, perfect, uh, perfect, as much perfection as I could to show, like, I will do all the work I'm asking you to do. So when I say, read, you know, bring out the tires and wheels and reorganize so we get all 400 of them up front, you know, I show you how to do that, right? Uh, I do it first. But anyway, that Torrent store, I think at the time, the high for a month, and it's such a defunct company now, they're long gone, so I don't, I don't count it as, you know, uh, information I'm giving away. But I think that store at the time did about 140000 a month, mm. you know, which, you know, we're talking 80s, 1980s. That's crazy. You know? So it was, it was a while ago. Uh, um, so it was five guys. And um, within five months, those five guys stayed with me, and we went to 14 guys. So 14 guys behind the counter. Like when you walk in, hey, we'll be right with you. Grab a number. You know, sometimes you'd have to wait an hour. As a matter of fact, one of the stores, the San Jose store in California, was the number one store in the country. Guys used to come into the San Jose store. This is no lie. They'd come in, grab a number, and just go. Go home. And they call in every half hour say, what number are you on? You know, so they wouldn't have to wait two and a half hours. Wow. Three hours. Yeah, it would get crazy. That company had such a draw 
because they had the lowest prices. They had great customer service. They had all the brands. Every brand they sold, they were number one dealer in the world. You know, they had buying power. Hmm. But my store, in five months, we went from five guys to 14 guys. And then it was so busy and so exciting, my regional manager would say, I'm going to come to your store. My divisional, my Western state sales manager, the vice president, because they were, you know, they were based out of Newport Beach. The, the headquarters was down there. I had had, at one time, 21 guys behind the counter. That's a lot of guys. Up. A lot of 21 guys, and we're all hyped. We're all high fiving. We're all double teaming. I'd team up these two guys against these two guys to see who could beat each other in sales. It was tremendous. And um, in five and a half months, we did, uh, you know, like I said, they wanted 10% increases. Right. 76.9% increase. Look at you. It's almost as if yeah. you, you remember. I mean, the, the biggest increase in the whole country. And, and the reason I am excited about it still is because I learned so much about um teaching you know to treat the customer right don't don't judge this guy because he's got holes in his jeans and a dirty shirt you know you learn you mm. learn like hey this guy's asking about center lines and comp ta tires which was top of the line then and he doesn't look like you have 10 bucks then he, you tell him but you you learn like you talk to him like everybody else you tell them the prices. You tell them they look great. This is the ones I'd recommend. Here's what I think. You gotta be like, yeah, I'll take them. I mean, a wad of cash. You, you couldn't ever judge somebody by their appearance. You're you're talking about areas that there was offshore oil workers, mm. there's hardworking guys, street racers, drag you know, drag racing on the street. All that was around that area. So I learned a lot about people and managing and keeping things neat, clean, and organized, and training. You know, that's where. I think that company gave me more than just money. It gave me, um, it gave me structure to know how to do things right. And it, I already was that way anyway. You know, I was already a, a, a neat freak. I already liked to do car detailing, right? So it, it just worked out for me. I learned so much that, um, you know, I wish it wouldn't have ended, but I did. I did quit that job. I finally got topped out money-wise as a manager. At least that's what they told me. And they are bringing back the old manager of this store as my my manager because he moved up. And I'm like, no, I just smoked this guy by seventy <laughs> percent. I'm not the, you know. But anyway, I don't begrudge that. Um, and you went back onto the mobile truck after that. Yeah. So right after that, I got into the mobile detailing. I actually built the truck with um, my one two of the managers I worked with quit also. And those, those two guys and me started the mobile detail. Oh, I thought you were by yourself. Well, I was, but what happened was initially, uh, one of the guys, uh, he had a Toyota truck and he was in the, in the, in the Valley in Van Nuys and I had a Toyota. So we were going to hit the Valley and orange County and he didn't, he didn't last long. So we, we'd send out, thousand thirty thousand flyers in the penny saver which at the time was a weekly uh advertising magazine and so we had calls from van nuys and calls from you know the beach area so i was driving so much mm. uh, that i learned right away like yeah this isn't gonna work i'm on the freeway stuck in traffic missing appointments half my days driving when I should be working. So I learned pretty quickly, like that's not going to work, but it, it did get me the start in the mobile detailing. And, um, so that, that's where all that came from. And uh, so when you, so you did mobile detailing for another year or two or something like that. And then you left. I and, did mobile detailing for maybe 10 years, 12 so, years. All right. I so you're, a lot of car. you're 10 yeah. years in, you said 1983 was the first one. So like you're in the early nineties at this point. Uh, 84. No, I detailed till about full time to maybe 1998, 1999. No kidding. Yeah, and then, then my truck got wrecked. <laughs> Somebody ran into me and it was like, well, I'm going to have to fix the truck. And at the time I thought, do I want to put this back together or just drive my truck again? So I decided that's it. I'm done with mobile detailing and then started working at a stereo shop with some friends of mine in, in car stereo. And how old are you at this point? Uh, uh, 
like late 20s, early 30s? Early 30s, mid 30s. Mid 30s, you yeah. work at a stereo shop now. Where's this? Uh, it's in uh, Santa Maria where I live now, which is, like I said, a couple hundred miles north of L.A. And um, I always liked stereos, and I used to hang out at the stereo shop, and I'd always pick it apart like, you guys ought to do this, and you guys ought to. I used to try to help customers, you know, because that was my background. Yeah. And so finally they said, hey, Kevin, you want to come help us with this store? All you got to do is displays and organize and stuff like, yeah, are you kidding me? I don't got to deal with the problems like done. So I worked, I worked that job for a long time and I just put in every hour I could. So there was times I'd do 300, I get paid for 322 hours a month, you know, like, dude, you know, yeah. it's a good deal for me. Right. And I learned a lot more about stereo and made more new and good friends, lifelong friends there. And so would you say like your last day, the day that your car got hit? Your truck got hit. Was that the last day that you professionally detailed or no? No, I had a couple of customers that I just go to their house and do it. So I, I'm still a big fan of mobile detailing. I know that if you're mobile, you can't necessarily, you might think, well, I can't afford a shop. But then the other guys think, why would I want one? The overhead. I like going to customers' houses and going to where they are. Um, they like the convenience. Sure. The other end of that is guys that never did mobile. Like I, I don't know how you could qualify that as an actual reputable business you know like you don't have a shop you don't have a building you don't have the overhead i do you can't you have to do cars outside in the dust and the dirt and the rain that you can't be a detailer i can assure you um some of the garages i worked in the, uh, for people that had cars or they would far surpass any detail shop that sure. i could have worked in yeah. right so i think either way whether you're mobile or your fixed location you, you still can do top caliber work and have great customer service and make a very good living at it. Mm. I don't think one is superior than the other. Obviously, paint protection films, you don't want dusty environments. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that obviously, makes sense. there's drawbacks to eat. There's pluses and minuses to each way. Flat out, some people are just not going to pay the money to transport a car or drive a, a, a classic car or a very rare car down the street to your detail shop. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd rather have you come to them. So I think both are viable. I, I agree. So at this point, uh, radio, uh, you know, stereo shop, how many years? Four or five years? Yeah. Yeah. And then after that, when, what did you do after that? And I'm, I'm trying to get to the point of when buffdaddy.com was. I, I finally, you know, I had been wanting to do a website. I didn't know how to do a website and I didn't really have the money to sit there in, you know, all day and night to learn it. So, uh, my friend, one of my friends said, well, Hey, what's, what's it going to take? What, what does it cost to do that? I'm like, I don't know, but I don't have the money. You know, I got to keep working. I, I, I never made a lot of money at any of these jobs and I don't begrudge people that do. I am one of the biggest capitalists that you'll ever meet. I respect and appreciate and, and strive for, to help people that want to become, you know, highly successful financially in business. That's why I like you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean, truthfully, uh, Meeting you, uh, I've had an opportunity to see you grow and to have some input. I don't think I would be able to, or maybe I wouldn't even want to do what you've done. The sacrifice is immense. And quite frankly, just because somebody wants to start a YouTube channel doesn't mean everybody wants to watch you. <laughs> but you have made, you know, not to change the subject to you, but mm. <clears throat> excuse me, you uh, have put in the time and invested not just in in time but in money in yourself and if people knew the backstory on you like the investment of time and money that you have uh, put into your business is tremendous it's very rare uh if they knew the backstory they'd say this guy is is the epitome of the american dream you know well i appreciate that i know you and i have those conversations <clears throat> offline a lot because yeah. i freak out and ask your well, opinion about this or that or whatever, but yeah. And the ethics are through the chart. That's the big thing. Ethically, business-wise, product-wise, doing the right or wrong thing. I've seen you walk away from things so many times that mm. you just felt like it's not a good look for me. It's not the right thing. Something about it rubs me wrong um, or the product's not where I want it to be. Yes, it's great, but it's not where I want it to be. I'm going to go to, you know, number 60, uh, formulation 61. Formulation 65. 
I drive, you know, the so, story of my life is I drive everybody crazy because I just need it. It's got to be the, they're like, you're so, and I'm like, you know what? That's what translates to the product and the company being the way that it is. So I, I have chemists and, and everybody around me wanted to choke me every five minutes because it's. Yeah. It's but just, when you buy a product that says ammo, it's on your shirt. Uh, people see that. Okay. They, they, they can see. People aren't stupid. You know, people know when somebody's legit. Mm -hmm. By and large, you didn't grow to 2.2 million followers on YouTube because you're a BS artist, right? There's something in you that they maybe they don't want to identify or need to identify, but like, I like this guy. Mm. You know, doesn't act like he knows everything, tells me like it is. When he messes up, I learn about it. He, he tells me he doesn't understand it. Let's get somebody else that does. I want to support him. And it's kind of like I've always said, it's it's kind of like trying to figure out in marketing or in brand identity. Um, I go to McDonald's probably four or five times a week to buy coffee or a Happy Meal or something, you know, whatever, an apple pie. Um, but I also go to In-N-Out Burger. Now, In-N-Out Burger is not anywhere near as large a company as McDonald's. I mean, most people have been to a McDonald's or go there, but they don't tout it, right? You go to In-N-Out, you can buy a t-shirt with a hot rod on it and an In-N-Out sign. You can get a bumper sticker. You can get keychains. You can get all these things. And people put the shirts on their back and the bumper stickers on their cars with pride that they go to In-N-Out hamburger. Why doesn't anybody do that for McDonald's? And I, I don't have the answer necessarily, mm. um, but I don't have a McDonald's bumper sticker on my truck. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> to be fair, I don't have an in and out. But my point is, what's the missing link? What, why, why do people aspire to identify with in and out but not McDonald's when they go to both and maybe McDonald's more? Mm -hmm. My point is, is your identity, ammo, people see something in that where they want to associate with it. And I think that the people that do, uh, they've made a good decision. Yeah, you know? I'm hoping it's the authenticity. That was the reason why I started the whole thing where I was just like, hey, I, I see, I, I, I have enough I'm, uh, a knowledge to understand a little bit about the business. Uh, I'm dangerous about that, but not, not uh, fully you know, where I need to be with, with Eileen and all that. And I, I trained, but the point I'm making is I could see what they were doing and I have a thing about getting tricked. I, I, I can smell if there's something going on right now, like that kind of thing. And I felt that aura, that aroma in this industry because it's easy to, oh, there's a problem. We can throw 17 products at you kind of thing. And I felt ammo was something that I could believe in because I didn't think I could, I didn't find anything else out there. This isn't a pitch for ammo. I don't know where we're going with this, but I couldn't find anything. And I was like, but everybody keeps saying that now. And it drives me nuts. It drives me nuts. You ever see the, the remember, we're talking about, I, I can go down a rabbit hole in this, but we're talking like 10, 15 years ago. There really wasn't anything. I remember um, a, a, this guy, Dylan, said, hey, you were the last one to get in before 10,000 other ones were started where they're like, oh my gosh, look what he, what, this is his words, not mine. Look what he, you know, Dylan, I'm talking about. Um, you were, everybody else is copying to some degree, you know, that model that you created, you were the last one to get in, you know, McGuire's and mothers and all the big ones. And then during that time, it was just very tumultuous to me. I, I felt like a lot of private equity is coming in. Uh, people were being bought up. It's public knowledge. McGuire's was bought by 3M, uh, you know, all these kind of things. And that, uh, culture, that brand, that authenticity, authenticity, I felt was starting to get twisted and I didn't have anything. I didn't have an in and out burger to put across my chest. And so that's where the ammo thing came up. I think that's the real story, but I almost can't say it now because it's so trite because everybody else is like, there wasn't anything else out there. I'm like, nowadays yeah. there's everything out there. I mean, you can find really good stuff. Even in my competitors are all, they're all great. They're all, it's all wonderful it's stuff. A lot of great product. Yeah. It wasn't necessarily about the product I'm mm. talking about. I'm talking about what you were talking about that I wanted to feel pride at, in something and truthfully, not read it, you know, um, tongue in cheek wise. Uh, that's why I am. I wanted to wear something across the chest that made me feel that I was doing something not menial because I came from the, you know, the, the stock market thing where you're like, everybody thinks you're 
the world's greatest person because you're a stockbroker because you make a lot of money when it turns out they're because I've been there in my experience I won't generalize in my experience they were all dirt bags in my experience and I was like I don't want to be like this is insane he, this guy's held on a pedestal because he trades something that really doesn't do anything it's not you're not really helping anybody you're taking it from here and putting it to here I was yeah. like what the hell are we doing everybody's making so much money this is great and then when I left to do the car wash thing you're like a piece of garbage because you're a car wash guy and so anyways, yeah. I could go down a rabbit hole here, but that's where the ammo thing came in, the in and out thing that you keep talking about. That's what mm -hmm. I want people to feel like. Authenticity, this totally makes sense that this this person eats, breathes, sleeps, this kind of thing, which is uh, what happened with when I did the Cayenne, the guy who built the Cayenne <clears throat> recently. That dude, is his name is Mike. The guy's out of his mind. I mean, he's like you detailing, it's like him building the Cayenne. Like every little, I mean, he's like sitting there, he's like, I'm like, dude, we, we got the shot. It looks great. Everything is, he's like, no, just, I, I, I mean, he stayed there for hours, like just like shaving little thing. And he, I mean, it's a piece of artwork. So, well, that's the thing is when you do these things to this degree, the mistake is made when somebody thinks, well, you're doing it for me. <laughs> like, no, I'm doing it for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm built this way. You know, I either something in me did, you know, something happened where having something not perfect caused me a problem or it gave me great satisfaction or it intrigued me. Like, how did they do that? So whatever motivated you to become exceptionally good at something or um, to aspire to be some, uh, good at something, it, it came from within. It did. It, it's not always just like, I want everybody to look at this and say, this is the most perfectly clean, clean car in the world. Well, 99 out of 990 out of a thousand people don't look at it that way no, they don't no. pick apart that way that, yeah. honestly that's why if you look here that's why i call it this is not a car wash it is uh you know to some degree uh you know tongue-in-cheek or whatever but uh I, I wanted it to be i wanted people to realize that when people come in here they're like hey man are you a car wash i'm like it's, it's kind of a running joke and i'm like no we're not a car wash i thought you wash cars cars come out here clean it's like I love you. There, and, and there's no um, sarcasm. They're not trying to be funny or whatever. They're really asking if this is a car wash. And so that's why I thought it was, there's so much more behind that. I was like, no, we're, nah, we're so much more than a car. Like there's a, there's a bigger thing going on here. So I thought it'd be funny uh, and sort of poetic to, to yeah. name the, the podcast. Well, it's not a car wash. I don't know where we got sidetracked. We got, we got sidetracked on a ton of stuff. We're an hour in. I didn't even ask you the question, which hopefully people, we're going to cut right to it. Art versus craft. I wanted to make sure I had those words right. You did a post a hundred years ago on something. I'm pretty sure you're the one that did the post or maybe you responded to the post and people yeah. went bananas and everybody like, no, we are artists or this is art or whatever they were. They were right. Versus... Yeah, and it was a very innocent uh, concept or statement at, that I had put at the end of one of these articles I write about how to polish paint or mm. how pads work, you mm. know, one of those. And the end of it, you know, the synopsis was, Paint polishing is not an art. It's a craft. And all I meant was that it's not subjective. Like somebody doesn't look at it like, oh, I see where the artist was going with that. Yeah. Or, oh, this right here, you know. Yeah. It's either swirl-free or it still has scratches. Or it's dirty it's either, or it's clean. Yeah, it's dirty or clean. And so people took a hit from that, an ego Like, like a fence to it? Well, I don't know if it's a fence, but when I said it's a it's a craft, it's not art. It's not an art. It meant that you. It, what I was trying to say was like, don't be intimidated. If you do not have talent, this is a craft that you can learn. Right. Okay. So it's going to take a while, right, to become a craftsman. But you don't have to have an innate or an intangible talent god-given talent as an artist yeah right you just have to have the desire mm -hmm. so you have to have a skill level and how do you get that well in my opinion you get a skill by two two primary things knowledge which you can read about or watch you know if you want to race a car you can get magazines about cars car racing you can go to the track watch them race you can talk to the mechanic you can talk to the driver you can talk to the engineers you can talk 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 watch 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 
all you want. That gives you knowledge. Experience is like get in the car and drive it, right? Mm -hmm. And the, the combination of those two give you a skill level. So you could say a lot of knowledge, not a lot of experience, or the other way, which one is better, which one will make you a, a skilled, uh, a high skilled person at that craft faster? I don't know. I would think mostly experience over knowledge, but it depends upon. I would agree with that as well. What we're talking about. Because mm -hmm. if you're a chemist and you blow yourself up too many times because you don't know what you're mixing, that's a problem. Right. Yeah, but on the By flip side, large, if you're a chemist and you've had your your face in the book for a hundred years, and you go to walk down the street and your shoelace is untied and you trip on it, yes, that, there's yes. there's that other side too. Yeah. So I was trying to say, don't be intimidated or don't don't buy into the idea like if you don't know how to rotary polish, you don't know how to polish paint because there's those kind of things. This machismo ego thing, mm -hmm. and I understand that because I was exclusively polishing with a rotary for 17 years. I'm very good using the rotary. But at some point, you can't deny it. Technology changes, and new things come out that can rival or surpass your skill level, uh, give a better result than what you can do with a rotary. Like If I had to compete against myself rotary versus DA, I don't want to be the rotary guy today, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that things have changed, and maybe they'll change again. But the point is, how can it be? Uh, you know, I think people are reading it as um, I'm saying it's it's a craft. It's not an art. Well, I'm an artist. Well, I didn't say you can't be an artist with a buffer. Artist is your desire. You know the way you go about doing things. It's not this art and artist are different categories. So my point was like, look, how can a guy call me at eleven o'clock at night? from Massachusetts and I'm in California, it's let it's, it's 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. where he lives, right? And he's like, Kevin, I got a problem. I've been working on this car for five hours. I cannot get the haze out. And within 20 to 30 minutes, the guy is elated that it's now he can perfect the paint. I don't know the guy. I couldn't see the car. I can't see his buffer. I can't see the swirls. I can't see how much liquid he's putting on. I can't see how he's holding the buffer at an angle, moving fast, slow. I can only give, get feedback from him. Like, what are you doing? Tell mm -hmm. me what happened. And yet, if it's an art, how did I make him a better artist? How did I make his art superior than it was 30 minutes before when I couldn't even see it? It's right. not an art. It's a craft. I was able to take the information he gave me, diagnose what he's doing, recommend a procedural change, and then give me feedback and we go at this loop again and again and again. So that's what I mean is you can learn this. It's a craft. It's not an art. If you're passionate about it and you want to be an, a detailing artist, okay, but that's not the same thing. But is, isn't that interesting? Mm. At least to me, uh, I was just basically saying there's no way I could make an, a, an artist a better artist by not seeing his art and not, not being there with him. You know, I, I was talking from one, one craftsman to a journeyman craftsman, essentially. And uh, by tweaking procedures and getting feedback and giving recommendations, I made helped make him a, a better craftsman. So that's what that was about. Yeah, I think it really personally has to do with, I think I, at some point I would love to get this podcast big enough and get on that you know, keep doing this on, on a consistent, uh, you know, weekly basis. And I want to get a psychologist in. I think detailers have are just bred differently as I'm sure, I don't know, maybe plumbers are or CPAs. CPAs would be a good one. I think they're a different breed of people. You've ever met a CPA? You're like, ah, you know, they just think differently or comedians or whatever. They just have a thing. I feel like detailers, I don't know what it is. There's just a thing where I know my gut is right. And part of it has a lot to do with this ego thing. Like the fact that you wrote up this, what I think is a pretty fairly art versus craft. I think it's kind of fun to talk about, but I, I've, ne I've never, I would never think to get um, offended or have my ego. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, just don't. I, just, I, I, I was at eating breakfast and I'm thinking I want to post something on Facebook. So I took that paragraph, that, that one sentence out of the paragraph out of my article and posted it. And I don't have a lot of followers, but 585 comments. Yeah. Basically you went boop and you poked somebody yeah. who believed that they were doing something 
art worthy. But I think your argument, if I like I was standing in court, your honor, you know, whatever, and, and to give the case, artwork is subjective. Cleaning a car, in my mind, I, okay, maybe there's some subjective. I, maybe we can argue that, but I just don't, swirls are not swirls. Dirt are not dirt. We can get into yeah. the, I like the way that it looks when the customer comes in or whatever. I, I just go like, hey, if you made the customer happy and there's tons of swirls in it, then and that's what he paid for, then fine. And that's yeah. what we talk about in the ATA and I talk about it with you a little bit. And so I think there's, I haven't yeah. quite flushed it all out, but there's some sort of psychological thing with the detailer, yeah. detailing dilemma, all that stuff that you absolutely just purple nurpled them and just went nuts on there. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't, my intent was to say, Hey, anybody that doesn't know how to do this, don't worry. You don't have to be, be talented. You, you can learn this very, you know, very easily if you follow some guidelines and look for things and yeah. And I'm prideful of my skill level of rotary polishing and mm -hmm. detailing, of course. So maybe it's a pride thing, but it, it, it was misinterpreted. And so did those people eventually take down that website of I hate Kevin Brown dot com or is that still <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm still there. Yeah. But all right. Speaking of that, as we head out here, um we're doing a thousand more um, you know, podcasts and we're we're sort of uh getting used to this program and, and, and picking it all up again. So I do appreciate your time on that. Buffdaddy.com, everything's going well there. Are you working on New websites, same website. I you're... am. I'm going to be rebuilding it. I, we, we, we transitioned away from that. But yeah, I, I thought I would spend, you know, three months rebuilding or building a website. It took me 18 months. You know, I was like, wow. And it's still running. Mm -hmm. No, not, it's not killing it. So I'm going to revamp the website. I'm going to go to a new platform that shows that it's more secure when it's, you know, it's the one I have is secure, but it doesn't have the stamp and, I don't know how to get it to do the whole website. So I'm going to, over this next year, redo the site and do that myself. And, you know, it's like, well, that shouldn't be too hard. Well, there's 2,500 pictures in the one I have now that I've got to migrate or get rid of and then forward those so I don't lose the links and all those kind of things. Yeah. But I'm really looking forward to simplifying the site. And I always appreciate the orders. I get a lot of uh, orders from you know, ammo fans. So I always appreciate you, uh, you and your, uh, your followers to purchase from me. Even if it's a $14 part, I'm the guy that sees it, prints it out, packages it, takes it to the post office. I'm a one man operation. So whenever you order from me, I see it. I, I remember your name and I appreciate the order. So hopefully I'll continue to get more and more of those when the new site launches I'm, I'm excited for you my mission my secret mission uh you don't know this so you can't listen to this part but my secret mission is to make it so that it absolutely buries you and you call me and you go <laughs> what the hell is going on I, I don't have time i got too many orders i can't talk anymore click that would be the day that i'm like Grr. so well, that'll be a great day <laughs> yes we'll, we'll keep working on it so uh hey, thank you for uh spending a great trip you're going to australia yeah i'm going to australia in eight days Dude, Australia is, um, I, le I love this. I leave on February 21st. We're, we're going to date ourselves in this thing, but whatever. On the 21st, I arrive the 23rd. It's like, uh, damn, <laughs> that is quite the uh, 21 hours. And so what's so, the purpose of this trip? Uh, the purpose of the trip is I'm opening up uh, Ammo Australia. So, um, you know, this is a whole longer conversation, but the short version is, as you know, I haven't opened up per the other thing we just talked about, about the pride and all that other stuff. And I've said no yeah. to a million things. I have over 800 requests for distribution of ammo. Most people don't know that. And I've said that. no. And I just, I want to control it. I want to make sure that it's pure. I'm not, the, we can have a whole conversation about that, but just know that you, you know the behind the scenes. I'm talking to the, yes. the people listening. So this particular one, you know, when you're just like, for me, when I met my wife, I saw her from across the gym. I use this all the time and, I, and everybody around me goes like, oh, here he goes again. I saw her from across the gym and I was with my, my roommate, my hockey. I played a lot of hockey and I looked at him and I was like, I'm going to marry that girl. And he's looking at me, he goes, what? He's like doing squats. I actually remember where and he's like, I'm going to marry that girl. She was doing overhead presses with the little barbell, you know, uh, dumbbells in front of this window overlooking the, we had a pool in the, uh, you know, this big gym in college, you know, the big college thing. And he's like, I, all right, bro, like whatever, you're an idiot, right? And so I saw her walking around. She was wearing blue shorts and a, uh, uh, like a Heather kind of gray shirt. And I was like, 
unbelievable, stunning. I don't even, I can't even use my words, blah, blah, blah. And so I eventually uh, ended up marrying her, to make a very long story short. So the point being is I knew what I knew when I saw it. I just knew it and I knew it when I talked to these guys in Australia. I, no, no to everybody. No, no, I'm not going to just, no. no a lot of times. I, a lot of times. A lot of times. The whole time. And so yeah. for some reason I saw these guys and I was like, they just, they just had it. I don't know. They had it. They had the Kavorka like in Seinfeld. They, he just had it. And so um, it's a place called Stash. And I think that name is brilliant, by the way. Stash is a car storage facility. They have 500 and something cars. Wow. Stash, cars, stash. I think it's, yeah. I just was like, ooh, I love the way and the way the logo is. And the, and the people that work there are fantastic. They're, they're crazy about detailing, crazy about storage, great business people, own several other businesses within that building that they own and also do that, also do car storage. Um, and then they have designer there. His name is Josh and he's fantastic. In fact, he's the one that made this for me. Cause I was like, I have this idea. Um, and he didn't you know, that's the one that's on the wall back there. Um, and so the point is they have the branding, they have the feel, they have the look, they say the right thing. And Australia is also considered the number one, or at least top three besides Norway, uh, ethical country to do business with. So, you know, Eileen, so my Eileen, my mentor, we could talk to her about, about doing business in certain places. I don't want to have a headache. Australia has been like my dream. It's been like the, the white whale for me, the, the, bucket, the bucket list, right? So I'm excited to go. We're opening up there. And what's interesting is we've opened up another website there. So it's not like I'm distributing. We had to build like you're building a website. We had to build yeah. a whole other website in another country. So now it's part of my other website. So I have my US version and I have the Australia version and they're connected. It's a lot of behind the scenes. So anyways, we're opening that up there and we're doing some, um, a ton of filming and whatnot. So we have, I, I, I don't know if you saw on my Instagram, we're going crazy on time here, but whatever. Um, on, on Instagram, I do all these videos. I can't say anything about what I'm doing. You know what I'm doing, but I can't say anything because I'm non-disclosured out, which is the dumbest thing in the world. But okay, so I'm like, hey, I'm going to Australia to film for a thing that is big, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm like this. I'm like, because uh, they have that's big and is not on YouTube, and it's on other things that you can see with screens. And uh, do you, I'm like, do I? Can I just say what it is at this point? So um, we may or may not be doing that there as well. Mm. So. I'm sure people listening are like, what the hell is he talking about? But at some point you will see it on another screen. That is not YouTube. You have to wow. be very, you have to be very that's challenging. Uh, you have to be, a, about. yeah, you probably figured it out. So anyways, yeah. that's what I'm doing in Australia. Thank you for asking. We're very excited. 21 hours in a tube. That sounds great. And you know, when you pay for these tickets, these tickets are bonkers expensive, as you can imagine to go to, um, for me to leave from New York, I have to stop in LA, you know, to you. And then to go to LA to Australia because I have to get off and I, and I have to film like the day that I get there after 21 hours in a tube. And I have to go talk at the Sydney Harbor concourse event. And we have um, a VIP meet and greet thing. We have a, a launch party. We have car show. I like, I have to be like marginally awake, yeah, rested, rested. <laughs> um, and I can't go in steerage, you know, in the plane, I'm like very big on going in coach. Cause it's like the front is going into the same place. Like who the hell cares? I'll just pay less. I don't care. But you know, I went to the next level. I'm not first, first class was $36,000. Oh man. And I was like, yeah. Um, and I have to do that twice. Cause I'm bringing Jordan with me. And I was like, Jordan, Jordan doesn't need the rest. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but I didn't want to be that guy. Like I'm going up in the first thing and you're going to sit back there. So I, I did the right thing. But anyways, um, what's interesting is, you pay for this ticket, which I, I went not coach. I went business class, right? It's the first time I've ever gone business class. It's going to be awesome, I guess. I don't know. You don't go business class from New York to LA. So a third of my trip, I'm sitting in the back, which is fine. But I wouldn't... Why am I paying so much more to be... You get what I'm saying? It's all, <laughs> So it's going to be awesome. It's going to be great. And uh, I downloaded some movies, but I'm going to be the only psycho like reading a book. I feel... Do you go on planes? Can you sleep? Nah, I can't I sleep. I, I long trips like you. Well, yeah. I have to like work or do something. I feel like there's nothing else. I can't like go outside and play with your car. Oh, I could definitely rest. I mean, but yeah, yeah I got to like read and like people. I went to Scotland. Uh, I had to stop in Amsterdam. 
it was 23 hours because of layovers and stuff. So yeah, for that I did I did rest. Yeah. Well, you know, last minute. I talked I talked to my dad. I said, we got to go to Scotland one day. You know, I want to go there. Yeah. So he called like a week later. Okay, well we're booked. I'm like, oh, 15 days with my dad. Wow. It was, it was it was a great trip. How long yeah. ago was that? Oh man, it was it was a while ago. I can't believe it's been um, 15 years ago. Wow. Yeah. What that's, a great what a place. I mean. Phew. That's that's we'll find out. that would be uh, that would be another bucket list thing. But anyhow, yeah. going to Australia. I know you got a ton of things to do. You're the man. Thank you for being on. All of you guys listening, visit uh, buffdaddy.com. Support the man and don't even support him. I want you to bury him so that he calls me back and gets on the next one. He's like, what the hell? I changed my website, all that stuff. So if you could do that, that would be wonderful. Check out the ATA 300. We have a bunch of cool stuff coming out in Australia, uh, which is going to be great. And um, yeah, anything else you can think of? I, I, I'm intrigued by the ATA. You brought the, that up. Um yeah, so we're doing we're doing well there. Um, I think it could be doing better. I think it's fascinating to me um, that people are more interested. And this is just facts. I'm not casting uh, you know a judgment on this, but it makes sense now as I'm learning. People are less likely to spend money on educating themselves on how to make money in detailing, not just like techniques, but how to make money and how to really change your life than they are to go in person and learn from someone the things that in reality are already on the website, already live. So in other words, I wanna go see this person so I can learn from him on how to do X, Y, and Z. But X, Y, and Z is already, it's already out, it's for free online. Mm -hmm. They're less likely, I'm trying to figure out the words to this, to spend the money to learn something that has never been posted online and is like the keys and the secret, so to so, the secret sauce or whatever the word is, to figuring out how to be profitable and actually sustain business. That they're not as. Do you get where I'm going with that? I, th I find that very fascinating. Well, let me ask you this: the people that have signed up, are they by and large in business, in generalized businesses or detailing business? I would say. 95% are in detailing business and another 5% aren't in the detailing business, but wanted to use the knowledge for their other business, which I thought was, yeah. and those couple of probably like 10 or eight or 10 or whatever it was, people that weren't detailers. I was like, what, what are you doing with this? They're like, Hey, I've taken um, outside courses for my, my, um, my work. And then they are able to help them fund outside training or something for uh, continuing education. And they're like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. Outside, you know, we I take all these training courses for my business, and I'm like, uh, and I, I was like, you know what, whatever, I'll take the detailing one. It's about business, and that's the best feedback I got. They're like, it this nobody teaches what you're talking about because you're literally that. That's what this guy was saying. So, um, I would say 95 percent are professional detailers, and a lot of them have changed the ways that they do it. The guy who actually edits my videos, this is the biggest endorsement because I pay him to edit the videos. Obviously, he's the yeah. editor. He changed his whole thing around. And really? the irony is he used my methods against me. <laughs> so his prices went up, his branding changed, his whole thing. I was like, what the hell is going on right now? He's like, his videos are amazing. I was like, but you didn't pay anything to watch these things. You know, so uh, yeah, that, if that, I thought that was a good endorsement. <laughs> well, but that's interesting what you said. So by and large, detailers would rather be in person learning or buy a machine. I I'm just being factual. There's no animosity. There's no I'm not I, I I'm trying to be analytical about this. So what I'm trying to think now is maybe this needs to be patched into some sort of uh, if you let me say it another way. If you and I hosted and I'm saying this uh, with no ego. If you and I hosted a training, it would fill out fill up or whatever in 2 seconds. And if I talked about the 90 nine zero episodes between 15 minutes and an hour long, 90 of them on the business side of it, I think they would absorb it. I think it would be great. But for whatever reason, we're not seeing the growth in that side of the training program of downloads. Yeah, there's something there. I'm just trying to hone in on, we're not creating anything. We are causing things to transition from ugly to beautiful. So detailers work with their hands with the goal of oh maybe i see where you're going so do they learn 
better in person and they get more excited about it in person and everything's flowing and they're energized in person versus like, I can't sit here behind the screen. Now, I, you, just, you might be, you might be right. That, that might be the case. So wired to before and after to touch things, to see it happen in front of them, to feel that uh, it's interesting. So my, my counter that. to that is the irony is the, <laughs> The video, the videos themselves, the thing that I'm training is talking about the efficiency of making profit, which is after tax dollars and the efficiency of that is counter is counter to us or one going to training. Why? Because you have to have housing. You have to buy food. You have to get on a plane. Your opportunity cost of you not being with your, with your business or at, at home or whatever the hell the case is, right? It's like the... On, all of that is counter to what I'm teaching. I know, but it sounds like you're talking about a passion-based business detailing for, for a lot of detailers. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but why are you detailing? Because I want to make a lot of money. Well, uh, how often does that get said? Why are you so. detailing? I love cars. I love car working with car guys. I like people that want – I want to take these cars to the higher level. I, I think that you hear more often than not the second rather than I just want to make a lot of money and detailing is the way I'm you going to do it. You are 100% correct. I'm having an aha moment, at, which is great, which is why I had no idea that we were going to get into this conversation. I ended, I tried to end this podcast and then you came up with the most brilliant – oh, crap. So that seems like <laughs> – I mean, I know I started. It was for the second reason. And if I could figure out how to make the money, that was – way down the list what was high on the list was how to become exceptionally good using a rotary and, and make the car perfect and yeah, I, I think of it differently though i think of it like if you're not making money you can't stay in the thing that you like and love and have that passion i'm going like how often how well, much more can, do you want me to donate broke. that's what i'm saying i at some <laughs> point i gotta feed the kids you'll be like how come i don't make any money right so i you i can do that a long time right I just, People I don't do want to come lot. off as a like, you know, I'm detailing because I want to make money. It's like, well, no, I left the most high paying job in the world to go make not. So like, yeah, check. So you did the same thing. Why did you go into the. Because Hello? exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Crap. I'm trying so to. How un... did you transition your mind? That's where. Because I needed to eat. Okay. Well, I was living in the back of my car. Yeah. And you, and you eat very well. And so my point is, is ATA sounds like the roadmap that you took Correct. Or the, to go from the passion-based business to a viable money-making business. Yes. And you didn't lose the passion. Right. Of course. That, that Yeah. I'm trying to figure out how to word all of that. So part of me yeah. was like, maybe I just have to do in-person training and then talk about those things. Because I really do want to help people and show them the whole thing, you know, the 90 episodes. But maybe it has to be in person. I I don't know. I, I don't. Interesting I, though. Yeah. I hope that I hope that it does well, so that the people that watch the ATA 300 can then become highly successful. But they can also pass on the info and oh. keep the detailing uh, hobby or craft alive. You know. I just had another aha moment. God, this thing is going forever. But I, I apologize. I know you got to run. Remember we did the ATA 200, and remember we talked about how that was the worst series on my channel. To this day, it destroyed my YouTube channel. Having said that, I got the most positive feedback out of any videos I've ever shot. So it's literally just like two opposite sides of the spectrum. Meaning in terms of YouTube, it did horribly, horribly. Enough where I had to take it off my channel because it was just killing the channel in terms of the algorithm or whatever yeah. the hell's going on there. And then in terms of the positive feedback, we got so much. So how... I'm trying to figure out what my aha moment was is because people want to learn the things that we showed in the video in person. Is that why? I don't know, but unfortunately everybody that wants to learn a cannot come to a class that we, cause we don't have one. Right. And if we did, you, you can't, you couldn't efficiently teach 300 people. You'd have to do 10 or five. That's what I always felt like when we went to these things. I think it was a great place to get started to be like, okay, here's the kickstart. But it's like, you got to go polish 10 more cars. Like, are we going to stay here for two weeks? Like, no, there's only like a couple of hours or whatever the training was. But it was like, these are the tools that you need. Here's what you got to do. Here's all the knowledge. Now go home and practice it kind of thing. 
And so yeah. I felt like that's what these videos are. Like we're, I mean, the 200, you and I in wherever the heck we were, I don't remember where we were. St. Louis. St. Abismo. Louis. Abyssal. Yeah. I mean. Drive Customs. Yeah. Right. So we did, I mean, if that's not the encyclopedia, I still refer back to that. I'm like, wait a second. What was that about again? I, you know, to jog my memory well, on. I tell people when that I do hear feedback on those because I recommend those videos and then I'll get feedback and, and the, by and large, it's good feedback, but they'll say, I just wish you could keep going. I said, you have to understand, uh, first of all, we would shoot 10 hours, eight hours, a whole day on one episode. Mm -hmm. Larry would put together, he'd scrap 95% of it. And he'd say, I got the video, take a look at it. What do you think? And it would be 48 minutes, 50 minutes. He goes, okay, what'd you think? Great. Check this out. Well, keep going. I'm going to show yeah. you right now. I have the scripts from it and people don't okay. right here. Watch this. Yeah. I'm, so, I'm so I would say, Hey, uh, you know, what'd you think of the, the, the ATA series? I loved it. I wish it would go on forever. And I have to tell them, well, we, we filmed each episode a whole day. As a matter of fact, there was a day that we threw away. The These whole are the day. scripts, yeah. dude. I have them right here. Cause they're like the Holy grail for me. Eight. Yeah. Look at this. One called ATA. Can you even see that? This is just one of them. ATA 200 with the numbers on it. Uh, yeah. There's one these. in there that we, we did a whole day. And the next day I came to, to work with you. And he's like, we're starting over. We're not using that one. Like, okay. But once you got them done and sent them to me, I'm like, I love it. It's great. I wish we could have put more. He said, no, we have to cut it in half. Nobody's going to watch 48 minutes. We got to do 20 minutes. I'm like, so can you imagine the amount of stuff that was left you know, yeah, then, yeah. I'm just but, trying to get to a conclusion of like, maybe I need to do. But like you said, it was the worst performing and you actually got people like, oh, I'm not here. Oh, they unsubscribed. Yeah. You want to be entertained, but you, but they tell you they want to learn. But then when you actually do a teaching one, like I'm out, I'm out. So, you know, you got to learn between the cracks. I guess you got to have just enough you know, new information in an entertaining video. Cause by and large, they're not watching you to be necessarily informed as much as to be well informed, but not to learn something. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah I, I you have videos that are sometimes more heavy, heavy towards chemistry or procedure, but the big ones are the ones that are like, wow, this Mercedes that this guy wanted me, his, his dad yeah, have detailed for his yeah. dad. That's the, there's emotion in there. There's story in there. That, yeah. It's different. I get YouTube is like, like mini to watch television. You. This is what I said before. You know, not everybody that wants to be on YouTube or be uh, a spokesperson or be a star just because you want it doesn't mean everybody wants to watch you try. Mm. So there's something there where you have to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, 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 and the whole combination where people are like, I like that guy. I'm going to buy that ammo product. And what's interesting is your product, where did it grow from? Yeah, you have ads now, but if you have an ammo product, by and large, you either watched an uh, ammo It's 95%, if not more, YouTube. Yeah. Or somebody said, hey, you ever seen this guy, Larry, he's oh, my yeah. guy on ammo? Word of mouth. Here's where you buy the stuff I'm using. Mm -hmm. you, you've been recommended or watched directly, and that's what's led to your sales. I, so, I would, yeah, I would agree with identity, that. the identity of ammo is, uh, you know, very unique. And um, it's not to say that other companies don't have that, but it's the McDonald's versus in and out thing again. Mm. You, have, you definitely have the in and out thing going. Well, on that note, let's get some cheese. Rolls, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm absolutely starving. An hour and 30 minutes. You are a saint. I appreciate you chatting. Um, Thanks for having me on. Yeah, we're going to do a bunch more, you know, whether you like it or not. That's under my breath. So we're going to do a bunch more of... Uh, uh, specific questions and things. And I'm sure people are going to have a ton of questions. We'll spend a half an hour answering, you know, X, Y, Z or whatever, but this Good. was uh, Looking forward to it. the first one back in the new place. And it's the same place, but the new paint. It looks great. Yeah, it looks yeah. cool. It's fun. It's, it's very dark in here. So I have lights everywhere. Like if I shut the lights off, it'd be pitch black. So <laughs> like it, the, the lights are the ones manipulating it versus like the sun. Cause sometimes it's like too sunny and too whatever. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's pitch black right now outside. So kind of interesting. Anyhow, all right. You're the man. Thank you, Brian. I'll talk to you very soon. As always, guys, thanks for uh, watching and listening. And uh, visit ammonyc.com for more information. Talk to you guys soon.